Hello and welcome to our final Lowy Institute event of the year. A very warm welcome to everyone joining us from Australia and to those dialing in from overseas. My name is Michael Fullilove and I'm the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. This event is part of what we've called the Long Distance Lowy Institute, where we communicate our content and analysis online while we're unable to do so in person. I'm delighted to have as my guest today, India's Minister of External Affairs, Dr. Subramanyam Jaishankar. Now, I'd be pleased to host any Indian foreign minister, both because of India's weight in the world, as well as the great promise contained within the Australia-India bilateral relationship. But I'm particularly pleased to be hosting Dr. Jaishankar. A mutual friend, the former US Ambassador to India, Richard Verma, described Dr. Jaishankar as one of the world's best diplomats, and I agree. He was born into a distinguished family of high achievers. He earned a BA at St. Stephen's College in Delhi before completing his graduate studies, including a doctorate from Jawaharlal Nehru University, specializing in nuclear diplomacy. He joined the Foreign Service in 1977, and he served in Indian missions in capitals such as Moscow and Tokyo, and was ambassador or high commissioner in Prague, Singapore, Beijing, and Washington. He also held a number of important posts back in India, culminating in his appointment as foreign secretary. After retiring from that post in 2018, Dr. Jaishankar joined Tata Sons as president of global corporate affairs. And then following the 2019 Indian election, Prime Minister Modi appointed him minister of external affairs, the first foreign secretary to occupy room 172 in South Block, the minister's office. I first met Dr. Jaishankar on a trip to Beijing a decade ago when he was India's ambassador to the Middle Kingdom. His son Dhruva was also a colleague of mine at the Brookings Institution back in the day. And I should say for the purposes of disclosure, that Dhruva Jaishankar, who's now the director of the US initiative at the Observer Research Foundation, is also a non-resident fellow at the Lowy Institute. I've long admired Dr. Jaishankar as a cool-headed, tough-minded, strategic thinker. I've wanted to host him at Bly Street for a while. We'd hope to do that this year, but I'm grateful that in light of COVID, he's instead agreed to appear virtually at this Lowy Institute event. Some brief housekeeping before we begin. I'm going to have a conversation with the minister for about 45 minutes. Then I'll put some questions to him that our audience members have pre-submitted when they registered online. All right, Dr. Jaishankar, I want to go back to the start of your life and ask about your upbringing. What were the key influences on your worldview as a young man? And why did you decide to become a diplomat? It's, a, I suppose, a long story. I think uh, looking back, clear, I mean, there was a very dominant influence, which was my father. Uh, he was a civil servant who went into a into the think tank world, uh, uh, in a sense, I would say very, very objectively, probably uh, of the previous generation, he was the dominant figure. And he did a lot to shape uh, Indian foreign policy and uh, defense policy, national security policy. Uh, and when you grow up in a household where, you know, you read the morning papers and you discuss what's happening in the world at breakfast, uh, it, it sort of seeps into you without your actually knowing it. It's a sort of osmosis uh, mm. process. So even though I studied other subjects, uh, you know, science uh, initially, in fact, uh, chemistry, uh, but uh, this was always the, the passion, if you would, or was the household connector. Uh, and uh, then when I reached the master stage, I decided I would make a you know, uh, I'd, I'd sort of study what real, you know, what was what was uh, uh, closest uh, to my interest. So I, I, you know, uh, part of it was also I think growing up in the Delhi of that era. You know, we look, it was an era. I was seven years old when we had the war with China. I was ten years old when we had the war with Pakistan, the sixty-five war. Uh, then Bangladesh was, a, was, a, was, I would say, almost like a defining event for someone of my generation. So some of it was the times, some of it clearly was the house. Uh, and then 
once I got into doing an MA in political science and then, you know, further degrees, then it was the university and, you know, the, the, uh, the environment uh, around you. Uh, so I guess all of that, but I must tell you a funny story here. Uh, when I was in JNU and uh, I, I was sort of ahead of my class, not because I was smart, but because I was put into school early by my parents. So I was uh, looking at doing a PhD and I got a very good offer from ANU. Mm -hmm. So I was actually on my way to Australia when I was all of 21. Uh, and uh, my father very, I mean, I don't know whether accidentally or manipulatively told me, you know, why don't you have a shot at the civil service exam? Uh, and my brother had just cleared it a year before. Me. Uh, and so I, I took the exam and ended up in the foreign service, but, you know, it, I could have been, you know, in a very different path with Australia very much earlier in my life than it turned out to be. Well, that's, that's ANU's loss, but uh, India's gain, I would say, Dr. Jaishankar. Uh, tell us, you, you passed the civil service exam, you joined the foreign service, you traveled, you served around the world. Um, you would have come across a lot of impressive figures over the course of your diplomatic and, and now political career. I won't, I won't ask, ask you to say who was the most impressive, but who has impressed you a lot as you look back over the course of your, of your career? Uh, what, what to my mind would be someone bold, someone imaginative, someone, someone with a, you know, with a, with a, how would I say, uh, really a global strategic sense. And there, I might be tempted actually to name Condi Rice. Mm -hmm. And the reason is a very direct experience we had uh, with that administration, which was, you know, the initiative they took on the nuclear deal. Uh, and if you looked at it, you know, all the, the South Asian expertise, the Indian expertise, probably in the American system would have said, don't do this. Because, you know, for them, it was India, Pakistan, etc. A lot of the non-proliferation people would have said, no, uh, you know, hang on a moment, think this one more deeply, which would be a nice way of saying no. But I think she approached it as a globalist. Uh, as someone who actually was thinking, you know, 10, 20 years ahead uh, and looking at where was the world going, that America would need different partners and different relationships and that India could be one of them. Uh, and uh, to my mind, you know, uh, I really saw that from the American end uh, as, uh, as the uh, sort of a judgment of a global strategist over narrow specialization. And I try in my own way to actually keep, you know, keep trying to get out of the boxes in which we naturally tend to seek comfort. That, you know, it's good to have area specialization, it's good to have functional specialization, but that ability to put it together and then think big and then say, well, that's the call I'm going to take. And it was a very big call which, uh, you know, George uh, W. Bush took. Uh, so, uh, and, and you can see in the 15 years later, what an impact uh, it's had. So that would be one, one answer I'll give you. All right. At the end of this stellar diplomatic career, as I mentioned, you, were, you received a battlefield promotion, as it were, to, to become the minister, the first foreign secretary in your system to become the minister. That's also, that, that's never happened in the Australian system. What's the difference between being the chief bureaucrat in the ministry versus being the minister? And what's more satisfying and what's more fun? Well, uh, I, you know, look, uh, uh, there's a difference, okay? Uh, I tell, you know, the first time, I, and you'll relate to this as an Australian, it's one thing to sit, as you say, in the gallery of the house and look at your minister on the floor of the house. It's another thing to be on the floor of the house. Mm. Uh, so, so that sense of, you know, the buck stopping there is much stronger as mm. a minister than as a, as a foreign secretary or a undersecretary uh, in, in uh, uh, the, the, perhaps in your parlance. The, uh, some of it is also, you grow. Okay. 
I think I was a decent foreign secretary. I would pride myself on the fact that I had a grip on my domain. But what I would say reflecting on the year and a half as a minister is my domains, my, my, my horizons have actually widened. I now see a lot of issues which may be domestic, which may be non-foreign policy, but which have, you know, somewhere there is a connection. Mm. I may not have looked at it with the same degree of sensitivity and awareness uh, earlier as a civil servant, which I would do today as a politician. And partly because you mix with a different crowd. You know, your peer group is, is very different. You pick up a lot of things. I mean, being with other ministers is an enormous education mm. because they bring to bear, you know, so many other things into your world. Mm. And then you stitch it together. And so, you know, in your previous question, as I said, you know, that ability to integrate and, you know, globalist, as I said, when it comes to foreign policy, I think it has, to, a minister is a much more holistic uh, outlook uh, than probably even the best uh, civil servant. And, mm. and I would, I would uh, make that distinction. And, you know, through my period, I, I had a, uh, as foreign secretary, I had a minister to whom, you know, I was, we were very close, both professionally and, and personally. And I had the comfort that, look, uh, eventually she was there. There was somebody, uh, mm -hmm. you know, she would tell me, it's, it's a phrase which works better in our own language, but like, look, I'm there, don't worry. Mm. That is actually something a minister should do and makes a big difference, which the benefit of which actually the civil servants, even including the foreign secretary, enjoy. All right. Well, you get, we get a sense of this holistic perspective that you've acquired in this terrific book, The India Way, Strategies for an Uncertain World. It's not that common, actually, for a foreign minister to publish a book of this sort of length and, and vision and thoughtfulness. What was your thinking in writing this book and what's the main argument you're seeking to make? Well, uh, let me uh, let me address the argument and then you'll understand. I'll, I'll then come to why I wrote the book. I mean, if I were to drill down and say, okay, pick two key words of that book, it would be rebalancing and multipolarity. Uh, and the case, the argument that I make is, look, over the last uh, 60 years, 70 years, the global order, the hierarchy has changed. The weight of countries absolute and relative to each other has changed. Uh, the capabilities have changed. And therefore, the world is really very much more different than it used to be. Now, you would say, well, that's reasonably obvious, but I would argue it's not. It's not because we're all set in habits uh, that we tend to and, and we also have an interest sometimes in perpetuating what, what is to our advantage. So the, the ability to, to capture change, internalize it and plan and strategize on that basis, that is actually a challenge. It's a challenge, not just in diplomacy. I think that change, uh, I mean, I can say this to you as an Australian, you can even see in cricket that the teams are not what they used to be, either abs in absolute terms or relative to each other. Mm. And this is still happening, you know, and it will always happen. This is an endless, endless uh, process. Now, what does it do? It basically, this, this rebalancing and multipolarity actually creates a new architecture. It, you know, the new structures, the new institutions, sometimes new regimes or modified regimes, new norms. And, you know, as we are all also seeing, sometimes new behavior that, the narratives, the conversations, the metaphors, uh, they, they all, all change. Now, all of this is taking place uh, in the backdrop of globalization. Uh, and, uh, and globalization always has to be in the mind of every you know, policy planner today, because uh, in, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of simplifying it, but for purposes of, of uh, uh, policy, that's useful. Uh, we are far more interpenetrative and interdependent than, than we've ever been. And, you know, analogies to the First World War era, et cetera, to my mind, don't get it at all. I, I think today our mutual dependence and our mutual presence in each other's lives uh, is, is so much more. Now, what it does is 
it creates actually constrained competition. That if you accept that competition is a natural way of you know, politics among nations, but you don't have that elbow room, uh, you know, or the many of the options which you would have in a less globalized era. And uh, you, you actually, whether it is finance or whether it's uh, tech stuff uh, or whether it's economic stuff, uh, the, you have to now play the game in this constrained competitive world, which sometimes means different ways of playing it. So what's the result of all of this? Uh, I think you have new metrics of power. You have no new instruments of policy. You have new agendas, uh, new, uh, new, new, sometimes new causes of competition. You have a new definition of national security. You know, uh, if you look at the post-COVID era, which I'm sure will come, my sense is uh, we will not look at national security in a defense or even foreign policy way. Mm -hmm. We will start thinking of health, of food, of uh, trade, of data, uh, of energy, all as a, as a much more uh, expanded uh, view of national security. And uh, the, the, uh, the issue would be uh, sort of uh, how, how do you, you know, deal with this? And so I actually spent quite a lot of time addressing what are, in a sense, are new nationalisms uh, that have uh, come about. And there is a latent bit in my book, bear in mind, I, I sort of finished this by late spring uh, uh, of this year. Uh, so it was well before uh, the American elections. But you know, the, the debate which now you, you can see picking up about declinism, that mm. is the West declining, is America declining. I've sought to, no, I've not addressed it frontally at that time, but it is there somewhere in that book. And I've addressed it from a Indian perspective that, you know, I don't, you know, I, I'm not myself a, a great uh, uh, believer in that uh, view. Uh, I mean, there, there are debates. I, I, in fact, I just saw a very interesting piece by Kurt Campbell and Rush Doshi uh, on, on this uh, subject. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, to my mind, it creates an argument uh, for, for a different relationship between the West and India. And that's something which I've actually devoted uh, uh, a chapter to. So to sum up really, if you ask me, why did I write this book? I would say reason one would be to get Indians thinking about the world. That, you know, sort of uh, uh, their sense of, uh, you know, uh, their alertness to the changes in a way. Uh, I felt is some, you know, somebody needed to trigger it and fan it and create a domestic debate. Secondly, I felt it was useful that the world must know also the changes which are taking place in India. What are the Indian thought processes? You know, somebody needs to articulate it in a reasonably uh, systematic way and in a, in a uh, sort of, I would say, in a contemporary and sort of uh, uh, relevant way. Uh, and, 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 you know, part of it again is if you look at how the world's been analyzing India, some of it I think is based uh, on a lack of understanding of what's happening in India. And I'd be happy to talk about that. That, I mean, I, I see the changes in India as actually the success of the democratic experiment. Democracy has produced today a different India than what it was 70 years ago. And I think that's also something the world has to understand. And of course, the third part of it is this interplay. You know, what is India thinking about the world? What is what should the world know about India? Then how do we, you know, sit together and and uh, fashion out a uh, 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 new relationship? And certainly the COVID uh, element, because there's an epilogue uh, which has been added to the book, which was I wrote it as actually the COVID was at its peak, which was April, May, June uh, mm -hmm. period, uh, and uh, uh, you know that I think has sharpened many of the trends uh, that that I've spoken about. The long answer, but I thought I should explain it at some length. All right, uh, let's let's take up COVID briefly. Give us an update. Give give our Australian viewers, in particular, an update about the effect that COVID has had on India and how how you think India will bounce back from the pandemic. Well, look like everybody else in the world. 
I mean, it took us completely by surprise. I, I you know, I, I think the, the scale, the intensity, the enormity of it was, you know, was just beyond imagination. But it was also a fact that we were, you know, like many other nations, completely unprepared for it. You know, uh, when the COVID hit us, for example, there was no PPE producer in India. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't make ventilators in India. There were two companies who were actually assembling N95 masks. Uh, there was no testing uh, kits being made uh, for this. So if you looked actually at our, at our ability to respond, it, it, was, it was not that we, at, our, at our ability to respond. It, it, was, it was not there. Uh, and uh, now what we did was uh, buy, we bought ourselves time. We were one of the early countries which went for a very extensive lockdown. And during this period, we actually built up uh, a, an enormous response system uh, at, at a very high speed. Uh, so we set up uh, about 15,000 dedicated COVID centers across the country. Uh, we were, we are, uh, we have today, you know, uh, a very large number of uh, companies, uh, more than 100 companies which make PPEs. Uh, we, we are, we are, uh, uh, more, more than 25, 30 producers of uh, ventilators. We are actually beginning to export these now. Uh, and uh, uh, we do think, in fact, uh, we are not only producing testing kits, but we actually think it's an area where uh, some of the initiatives underway may lead to dramatic, uh, you know, reduction in testing time. So uh, there's some potentially good news uh, very, very uh, near in the horizon. And of course, uh, now with the vaccine coming on, uh, I think our ability to scale up production is going to make a difference uh, to a, a lot of uh, vaccines, I think, including probably the Australian one. So uh, what uh, at this moment, I would say a, a sort of a short summary of where we are would be we, we seem to have peaked, uh, you know, that August, July, August, part of September. Uh, the cases, the daily cases are down to uh, one third of what the peak was. And similarly, that is the case with the fatality rates as well. We have a very, very high recovery rate. Uh, it's in the 90s, 90 percent. And we have an extremely low fatality rate. It's just a little more than 1 percent of the people infected. And I think a lot of that reflect our preparedness that we sort of put in place. Now, since uh, August, we are back. We are trying to move towards economic normalcy. Uh, and uh, certainly the economic figures for September, October, November have been quite encouraging. I think in very large parts of the economy, we are back to pre-COVID levels. In some cases, many cases actually much higher. But at the same time, I'd be very honest, I would say there are large parts of the economy which still are, are uh, uh, you know, have to come out of it because, uh, you know, the informal sector, a lot of the services sector, uh, they, they uh, uh, because the social distancing norms have uh, uh, affected their business, uh, they are going to take uh, some time. We've had a good agriculture season, so that's, that's quite helpful. So, I think the overall sense is uh, our financial year is till end of March. Mm -hmm. At the end of the financial year, we will probably, uh, we will still be in the negative zone, but much less deep than it looked like at the beginning of the year. Uh, and I think we will hit again the 8% growth rate uh, into, the, into the coming year. People are fairly confident that is happening. And it's been... It's, you know, look, it's been a process of self-discovery in a way that, uh, I mean, when I look at the discipline which people showed, I mean, in India, I mean, you, you, I, I, you go around Delhi, it is, you will not see a person without a mask. Okay. I mean, everybody, I mean, it's now sort of almost an instinct now to go in, use the hand sanitizer, mm. keep your social distancing. So it's seeped down. And a lot of that, I think, has been the leadership. I mean, the leadership was very clear, Prime Minister particularly, in going out there, being on the TV, 
telling people, saying, look, be careful. This is what you need to do. This is for your own good. We had a festival season. The Prime Minister made a special effort to tell people, saying, look, don't let the festival season let you drop your guard. So one part of it has been a sort of a leadership uh, reaffirmation. But the other part of it has been to me very interesting, which is digital. Uh, that, uh, you know, our main contact tracing app was a digital app on everybody's phone. It had, it worked extremely well uh, in terms of, uh, you know, ensuring uh, quarantine and uh, alerting people to potential problems. But it wasn't just the COVID. I mean, it was because a lot of the, especially a lot of the uh, people living in the countryside who migrate to cities went back home. We were able to put, you know, money in people's bank accounts on a scale probably which would be unprecedented in history. You know, probably, you know, something like 400 million bank accounts saw money go directly into it. Mm -hmm. Now, in the old days, if you were not digitized, frankly, a large part of the money would have disappeared on the way. Mm. Uh, similarly, we were feeding, you know, we were able to uh, give food uh, to people who, who, uh, who needed it. Mm. And we were able to send rations out uh, to 800 million people and make sure again that the right people got. So the power of the digital <laughs> has actually been a very uh, big, I won't say discovery because we somehow we all knew intuitively it was there but a, a validation of the power of the digital. That's been, uh, to my mind, the big takeaway uh, from this experience. All right, thank you for that. Now, uh, I want to take you through a, a couple of major powers uh, and ask you about India's relations with those countries quite quickly if we can, so I can get through as many as possible before I come back to the relationship with Australia. Let me start with China. You witnessed the ascent of Xi Jinping in person as the um, as the Indian ambassador to Beijing. What were your impressions of Xi Jinping? How do you think he sees the world? What are his ambitions for China? Put it this way. I, I think there has been an evolution in China. My book basically makes the case that 2008, 2009 was the tipping point for that change. Uh, and you have today uh, a China with whose uh, Engagement with the world is very different from the way it used to be conducted 20 years ago. Uh, now, you know, I'm, uh, uh, you could argue that it is natural as a country goes up the power hierarchy that its behavioral pattern would change. I, I reserve comment on it. Uh, but uh, clearly, I mean, no question that uh, you have a very much more nationalistic uh, China uh, and uh, that is expressed sort of down the line in, in a variety of ways uh, and often in, in policies as well. All right, let me ask you how India engages with China, even in the difficult times. Um, as you know, Australia is involved in a disagreement at the moment with China. I won't ask you about that. But of course, in India, we've seen tensions at the line of actual control escalate to the point of armed conflict, and yet you have had to manage uh, or maintain uh, your engagement with China. So what, what, is, your, what is India's approach to um, maintaining your cooperation with China at the same time, without giving in to Chinese coercion and without giving in to Chinese demands? Well, uh, you know, we, we have, we are today probably at the uh, most uh, difficult phase of our relationship with China. Certainly in the last 30 to 40 years, you could argue even, even more. Uh, the last time there were military casualties on our border was in 1975. So just to give you a, a sense of, uh, of uh, uh, time there. Now, why do we have this problem? Uh, we have this problem because from 1988, our relationship probably, I mean, it's had its hiccups. We've had our issues, differences are not, are not in denial of all of that. But if you look at the direction of the ties, the direction of the ties broadly were positive. You know, 
uh, 30 years ago, uh, there was virtually no trade with China. Uh, today, China is our number two uh, trade partner after the United States. There were no travel with China, you know, before COVID happened. I mean, uh, more than a million Indian when a fair number of Chinese came to India. So, you know, variety of ways, I mean, we engage each other pretty much in every domain of activity. Now, all of this was posited on the fact that while we were trying to solve the boundary question, uh, we would maintain peace and tranquility uh, along the border areas. You can have differences and you had, you know, there were patrols which came, you'd get into arguments, sometimes there'd be face-offs, but you never had, you know, uh, a sort of a major breach of this uh, understanding. Now, this, we had two agreements, in fact, not two, multiple agreements starting from 93, which essentially asked both parties, uh, both parties took the commitment not to bring large forces uh, to, to the bundle. Now, for some reason, which for which the Chinese have to date given us five differing explanations, uh, the Chinese have violated. The Chinese have literally brought tens of thousands of soldiers you know, with in, in the full military preparation mode, right uh, to the to the uh, line of actual control uh, in in Ladakh. Now, uh, it, it, naturally, the relationship would be profoundly disturbed by this. So, what has happened? And and then, you know, when you had soldiers very close up, uh, and it, you know, it was it was not entirely surprising that something went horribly wrong. So uh, the, the uh, fact is that uh, you've had, uh, you know, you've had, a, we've had 20 casualties out there. Uh, and uh, I, I think it has uh, completely changed national sentiment as a result. So today, how do we, how do we, you know, get the relationship back on track? I think that's a very big issue. And we are very clear that, uh, you know, retaining, uh, maintaining peace and stability, peace and uh, tranquility on the, uh, on, along the line of actual control is the basis for the rest of the relationship to progress. So you can't have the kind of situation you have on the border and say, well, let's carry on with life, uh, you know, in all other sectors of activity. It's, it's just unrealistic. So very frankly, the relationship this year has been, uh, I would say, very significantly damaged uh, and when you ask me how are we dealing with it well i have met you know i've had phone calls with my counterpart i met my counterpart when we were both together in moscow uh, our defense minister has met his counterpart the military commanders are in touch with each other our, you know our ambassadors uh, sort of do do what they have to do with their respective foreign ministry so we have multiple layers of communication, we are talking to, to the Chinese. So communication is not the issue. The issue is the fact that we have agreements and those agreements are not being observed. All right, let me ask you about an, a very different great power, the United States. The US has been a big part of your career. Um, of course, you knew or you, you got to observe closely the president-elect, Mr. Biden, when he was vice president, when you were uh, ambassador, and also Mr. Blinken, of course, who was a senior official um, in the Obama administration in that period. What kind of president do you think Mr. Biden will make, and what do you, what kind of relationship do you look forward to having between India and the United States over the next four years? Well, uh, you know, where uh, the president-elect is concerned, uh, I mean, I, of course, observed him uh, as vice president, including uh, during the visit, uh, the two visits that uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, made to Washington, D.C. Uh, but uh, we actually also remember him as a very, you know, positive senator uh, uh, who, who was of, uh, who made a very big contribution when uh, he was uh, in the leadership position of the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee. So his his goodwill for India, and and you know he's had in the in the course of the campaign as well, uh, occasions to express that. Uh, I I think that is is uh, very manifested. 
come to India also on a visit as vice president. I was not, I was in China at that time. Uh, but uh, where uh, Tony Blinken is concerned, yes, I mean, uh, when I was foreign secretary, he was my direct counterpart as deputy secretary. Uh, I knew him when I was in uh, Washington as well. And I found it very, very easy to, to work with him. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, uh, both in terms of his worldview as well as his personal characteristics. It was, it was something, uh, you know, which I could very, very easily uh, sort of uh, engage with. Uh, my, you know, I, I put it this way. Yes, I, I ground you. There is the, there is what you call the subjective part of it. The people, their views, you know, their preferences, etc. And my answer would have given you a sense that that department, I think, is fairly good. But I think there is a structural part of it, the objective part of it, which also we should look at, which is really what is it today that brings India and the United States together? Because uh, if you looked at the trajectory of this relationship, it has actually been remarkably uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, I would say, positive through what would now be the fifth administration, I mean, since Bill Clinton's time. And if you really have, let us say, very strong, continuously improving relationship with five over five administrations, however important the presidents are, we must also give credit that there's something, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, out there which is which is uh, which is you know some convergence, deeper convergence out there. And I I would say the as some you know I first started dealing with this relationship in 1981. Okay, Ronald Reagan had just become president. When I look at where we are there and where we are now, it's not just the goodwill and the positive. I look at the at the breadth of the relationship, of breadth of the engagement. Actually, that if you look at the business side, the students, the you know the tech relationships, the community, the the familiarity. I mean, I used to do the congress in the early eighties. You know, I used to have to explain you know where I was coming from. Mm -hmm. I mean, literally. Uh, whereas you know now uh, you have people who who are who are so much more. Uh, focused on on the relationship and on their partner. So the, there's been actually a qualitative uh, shift. Uh, I think it's structural. Uh, it's a it's a to my mind, it's an evolution which has taken some time after the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. But again, I come back to those two key words I told you at the beginning of the conversation. It's rebalancing and multipolarity. Mm. I think the United States today. Uh, sees India as in a multipolar world as having a more prominent role. The United States should be more conscious that it needs more partners. Uh, it needs more partners, uh, you know, beyond its formal alliance structures. And, you know, that's that's something uh, uh, we are respectful of, but we are, we are not part of it. And we have a different history. I mean, that's not, that's not the kind of relationship we have with any, any country. But this ability of the United States to work with more partners, I think will be one factor, a very important factor, why, why I, you know, this relationship is going to be very good. All right, speaking of, of new partners and developing relationships, let me ask you about India's relations with Australia. In the last few years, there's been a thickening of the relationship culminating in participation by all four members of the Quad, for example, in Exercise Malabar. What's your assessment at the moment of the Australia-India relationship? You know, I, 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 I would say in the last year and a half, at least this tenure as as a foreign minister, if there is one relationship I take great satisfaction in, it is the India-Australia relationship because I've actually seen it change in that year, year and a half. Mm -hmm. And I think I would credit both uh, Prime Minister Morrison and uh, my counterpart Murray Spain uh, for that. Now, why does this matter? Uh, it matters because in this multipolar world that I've described to you, where we have to look beyond, you know, old habits and established structures, we have common interests. I think we have deeply shared values. I mean, we're not only demo democracies, we're not only 
we are also commonwealth democracies and we are cricket playing the commonwealth mm-hmm. democracy mm-hmm. So, you know that's a quality of the standard of its own uh, and and we you know it's it's important beyond the one or two parts because sometimes we are too obsessed with the you know how is us china going to work out how is mm-hmm. us russia going to work out i am not mm-hmm. diminishing their importance but I, there is today a, a requirement for a lot of other countries with more capabilities to contribute to the shaping of the global order to ensure global good to secure the global commons uh, and i think here if you have you know converging interests and you have shared values and you relate to each other in in different ways uh, i think in many ways it's a partnership which was waiting to happen and since we had you know the the right combination if i can be presumptuous enough to say so at both ends uh, i i think it's worked exceedingly uh, well and it's not worked just between india and australia i mean i would urge you to look at the fact that we are actually expanding our our uh, sort of conversation i mean we have uh, today we have had a trilateral between india australia and japan for some mm-hmm. time but we are now looking at one with indonesia one with, also one with france uh, so the conversations are also getting uh, you know deeper and uh, more relevant and not just again between the foreign ministries i think it's it's uh, a lot of other people including defense uh, are in all right Uh, one more question on Australia. You have a very pithy line in your book where you summarize what you think India should do in the world and you say this is a time for us to engage America, manage China, cultivate Europe, reassure Russia, bring Japan into play, draw neighbors in, extend the neighborhood and expand traditional constituencies of support. What verb would you apply to India's ambitions vis-a-vis Australia? are you engaging us are you cultivating us are you bringing us into play what are your amb- what are india's ambitions for australia play cricket with australia <laughs> but uh, uh, look uh, I, i think with with australia uh, we certainly whether it's foreign policy defense security especially maritime security uh, one part of it is what happens between us okay we'd like to obviously promote more trade more education uh, more innovation uh, i think health is an area where we are woken up to the possibility so so there's a lot going on you know the, we are also the fact that we are market economies i think is is also helpful to this process so i would certainly be very supportive of more business of more policy interactions of more societal uh, sort of uh, engagement so that's one part of it the other part is really how do how do we india and australia sit down and figure out what can we do vis-a-vis the you know our respective regions and the rest of the world mm-hmm. i i think that's an equally important part of the relationship consequential for both of us and consequential uh, for the world so i i think there's another part of the book somewhere i don't have it readily in front of me where i've actually listed up saying look think beyond in a sense the p5 this is a different space has opened up mm-hmm. a different space has opened up for you can call the middle powers you know use use some anything a kind of a i would say a g20 but not p5 uh well, so the the other 15 you can you can say i think the other 15 today have uh, an opportunity a window to do more between themselves and between them and the world and i think india australia will be a very important part all right let me let me put some questions from the audience to you if i may minister um we had you mentioned before that australia and india are both democracies we had a a, a couple of questions from audience members about the condition of democracy and human rights in india um you might have and you might have seen minister there was recently a piece in the economist which purported to graph um the rule of law and freedoms and civil liberties in india for example and it 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 it, purport, it argued that there's been a dip in the rule of law and civil liberties under prime minister modi that's been the deepest since the days of the emergency under prime minister gandhi now 
You may disagree with that um, assessment, but can I ask you as Foreign Minister, are you concerned by, I think you, you kind of alluded to this a bit earlier, are you concerned by some perceptions in the West that India is moving in an illiberal direction? Well, you know, uh, uh, you cited that particular example. Uh, uh, it's a magazine, uh, it's, a, it's a publication. If you look at them over the last few years, uh, their political biases are pretty evident, okay? Uh, including in the election. Uh, and I've thought about it and, you know, not just about them, I mean, a, a larger, larger issue. And uh, my, and I've, I've sort of referred to it in passing in the book, maybe I should write a book on this uh, by itself. A lot of the problem today, uh, you must understand, is uh, those in the West looking at India and writing about India and commenting on India are not able to come to terms with the changes that are taking place in India. And what are those changes? I mentioned them at the start of this conversation. Mm -hmm. You had a very deep democratization of India. You know, 70 years ago, when you looked at what is the Indian leadership, you know, they would be much more English speaking, they would be much more big city, uh, they would be much more people like us, okay? So I would suggest to you a large part of why we are, you know, you get this kind of analysis is that you have people looking at India and saying, oh, these are not the people we know. They talk a different language. We are not sure what their thought processes is. Their social habits are different. So they are not the nice, nice Indians we used to know. They are different. Uh, and they don't make an, un, you know, an effort to really to understand this. Uh, I, I, I think in a sense, I mean, it comes down frankly to a kind of a globalization and elitism problem uh, that uh, we have, we are also having a cultural shift in India. Uh, and uh, so, so every election, they would predict that, you know, this is going to go the other way. I mean, not obviously, I mean, you cited a publication, look at their own predictions in the past. I mean, they pretty much got everything about India wrong in the last six years. And that's, that's to my mind, there's a bigger issue out there, which is, you know, how does this changing India communicate better with the world? And how do we make the world make the effort to understand us better? I, I think this is an issue. And frankly, to me as a foreign minister, it is a challenge that I, I uh, need to focus on uh, very strong. Minister, a couple of other questions from the audience. We had a question from Douglas Stewart Brooks, who asks the following. Do you see the relationship between Australia and India ever developing into formal trade and defence pacts? You know, I, I think, uh, I mean, a formal trade pact, uh, you, I, I think there's interest on both parties to, uh, there is a discussion on a free trade agreement, a bilateral free trade agreement as well, because as you know, we didn't sign the RCEP. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, I, I would say I can imagine and I think it would be very natural for us to have a lot of understandings and agreements. But my sense is that the that kind of thinking that it all revolves around alliances and formal structures, the, the world we have now entered is far more, uh, uh, far more, uh, I would say, ad hoc uh, and far more customized uh, than, than it used to be. Uh, so uh, uh, I can certainly see that we would have very strong defense ties and I hope very strong uh, trade cooperation. How formal it would be, I think is a very open question. All right, you mentioned India's decision not to join RCEP and you gave a speech last month setting out uh, why that was. Can I just ask you, um, what do you think, uh, in, in terms of India succeeding economically, what is the importance of global economic engagement to India's economic success? I think it's vital. Uh, I think it's vital because, you know, uh, globalization is like gravity. I mean, it, it's there. You, you, you can disagree with how, to, how it plays out, but 
it is in this day and age, nobody can be in denial of globalization. And if you look at the history, certainly, of Asia, uh, uh, all the modernization and economic progress in Asia has happened through greater global engagement, not with less global engagement. So I don't believe that the autarkic model uh, has a future at all. But here's the important bit. If you are going to engage the world, it's important you get your terms of engagement right. Uh, I don't think the issue is today engage or don't engage. I think the issue is engage right or engage wrong. Uh, and uh, 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 some of the issues on which I've been speaking on, particularly leading up to the RCEP is, I think many of the earlier engagements were not well thought through, certainly not well implemented from the Indian perspective. They've had a very uh, negative impact on the Indian economy. Uh, you know, if you look at the uh, trade deficit in the last decade uh, with RCEP countries, it has moved from $43 billion to $110 billion. Uh, and there are a number of reasons. Some of it uh, relates to us, some of it relates to the RCEP partners. I mean, there are issues of market access. We shouldn't pretend there are not. There are issues of subsidies. There are issues of non-market economies. All these are, are factors. But, uh, you know, I've repeatedly sort of emphasized in my book and I continue to do in my speeches and in my policy making, which is you have to use the world to get ahead, uh, whether it is in technology, resources, best practices, uh, markets, opportunities. Uh, so, and, and uh, the, the policy that we are now following is really build more, as we say, make, you know, build more capacities for make in India, but make for the world. That they are, we would welcome, I mean, we are very happy with the fact today that global, a global company like uh, Apple or Samsung has uh, moved part of the global supply chain to India. We welcome it. Uh, so we, in fact, have a policy today of, uh, you know, incentivizing more global companies in a very wide variety of sectors to come to India. We're making it easier to do business in it. Uh, so we are very global. Make no mistake about it. But again, I repeat, being global doesn't mean sort of blindly signing up to what other people put in front of you. I think you've got to negotiate your interests well. And as you said somewhere in my introduction, I am a very, very committed and passionate negotiator. We have a question from Yadu Singh who asks, what is the role for the Indian diaspora in strengthening Australia-India relations? I think the diaspora can make a difference. It has done so with many other countries. Uh, the U.S. would be an important example. Uh, you know what? What the look? The diaspora. The, there is the there is the old uh, the conventional argument, I would say, and in a sense, the emerging argument. The conventional argument would be, you know, people uh, Indians are very family centric. When they immigrate, they keep touch with their family. So there is a bond out there. Uh, there's clearly a better understanding of each other. And mm -hmm. if you look at uh, societies like Australia or uh, United States, even UK to some extent, I think the diaspora has been helpful in, in promoting that understanding. But I would say there's a contemporary uh, rationale today, which is emerging, which is really of a talent flow globally. And again, this is, by the way, a very powerful argument for globalization. We are, you know, talents are going to be unevenly located. And talents will always be in short supply. So how do you create a better system for a well-managed, legal, safe, uh, economically productive flow of talent? Uh, and I, I think here the diaspora is, is the practical manifestation uh, of that kind of knowledge economy which will have to be serviced by a global talent pool. All right, Minister, I want to take the Chair's prerogative and ask you the last question myself, if I can, and I want to ask you about cricket because we've touched on it a couple of times in the discussion and I know you're a big cricket fan. I know you've been watching the Indian tour of Australia over the past month. So I want to ask you about something I've always thought, which is that there are a lot of similarities between cricket and diplomacy. And let me make an argument to you. Like diplomacy, cricket is a long game 
and things are opaque in cricket, as in diplomacy. Sometimes a draw can actually be a win. And the weather conditions and the state of the pitch are critical. Uh, the ball swings in the air and it moves off, at, off the seam and sometimes it comes right at your head. And similarly, in foreign policy, the decision-making environment is fluid. Um, and, and finally, in cricket, uh, it's not just about um, pace, it's, about, it's often about leverage. You need, cricket and diplomacy require the same qualities, intelligence, skill, patience, discipline, but also toughness. Very few cricket matches are won by sweet reason. Uh, often leverage as well as logic is required, although leverage can take different forms. It might be spin bowling or fast bowling. It might be forceful diplomacy or force. What do you think? Um, I, I, have this argue, I have this sort of um, visceral belief that cricket playing countries have an advantage in the diplomatic game because we have this sort of strategic patience that test cricket has taught us. What do you think as a, as a, as a lifelong diplomat and a lifelong cricket fan? Well, you know, uh, my colleagues who work with me will tell you that I fall back on cricket analogies every time I get into a difficult situation when I want to explain something. But if I were to sum up my book, I would say my book is about getting the Indian team to understand that playing conditions abroad are not what they used to be. Mm -hmm. And that you need to prepare for this differently that the teams you are competing against are also not what they used to be, that they have today different combinations of attack. So watch out for that Shane Vaughan and prepare for that Glenn McGrath. Uh, so uh, I, I, you know, I, at the end of the day, I, I would say the, the similarity I see, because at the end, you know, finally it's all about competition. Okay. I mean, cricket is competition, foreign policy diplomacy is also competition. In competition, you do well when you think it through, when you prepare, when you strategize, when you ideally you can game the other side, uh, and you know an occasional sledging, I guess, is helpful. Uh, so, uh, so I, you know, I when when I get around to it, I'd love to co-author a book with you on how cricket and diplomacy can go together. All right, the Lowy Institute would be happy to publish that, that book and we'll take that as a commitment from you, Minister. Uh, let me say I've really enjoyed our discussion today. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, in my introduction, I spoke very highly of Dr. Jai Shankar, but you can tell, I think, from the quality of today's discussion that I didn't exaggerate. Um, congratulations on the publication of your book, Minister, The India Way. Thank you for joining us. This doesn't get you off the hook from visiting us in person, though. I look forward to hosting you here at Bly Street, perhaps in 2021. In the meantime, thank you for speaking with us today and good luck for the first test in Adelaide next week. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not only the end of today's event, but the end of the Long Distance Lowy Institute for 2020. It's been quite a ride this year, both for the world and for the Institute, and I'm proud of how my colleagues have adapted to the new conditions. They've produced outstanding research, analysis and commentary on events abroad, and they've also created tremendous online events with guests including David Miliband, Samantha Power, Jeff Goldberg, Susan Glasser, Gareth Evans, Julie Bishop, Jake Sullivan, and of course, Dr. Jai Shankar. So thank you to my Lowy Institute colleagues, and also thank you to you, our audience, for supporting the Institute this year. We look forward to seeing you all in 2021, hopefully in person here at our headquarters on Bly Street. Thank you and stay well.